Hello, hello, good morning. Man, it's good to see you guys. Hey, you made it. Well done, I'm glad uh, that you guys didn't actually take me seriously when I invited you to take a vacation on the day I was teaching, so well done. Maybe, like, well, maybe you guys are just the ones who couldn't find a last minute deal. I don't know. Anyway, welcome. It's great to see you guys. Hello to everyone on the live stream. We live stream, by the way. You guys, you guys know that? I think my mom's watching this morning. <laughs> oh, man, it's good to be here. I'm excited. This is, this is going to be cool. Um, it's always a privilege to be up here and uh, speak the Word of God. Thank you for allowing me to do this. I'm grateful again this morning to have the opportunity to, uh, to speak to you. And, and I tell you, I love that we walk through uh, books of the Bible here, verse by verse, on Sundays, but I kind of also love days like today, you know, I get to just basically tell you about what God's been teaching to me and pass it on to, Luke, on to you, so um, that's pretty cool. Well, the past couple months, I've been studying uh, the gospel of Mark, and recently I heard a message on Mark chapter 7, it really resonated with me, so I just want to take the things God's been teaching to me, and again, just pass it along to you, so uh, there's a, a, a pastor in San Diego, he's pastor Larry Osborne, he's an author of uh, some great books, one in particular with a really cool name called uh, Accidental Pharisees, and it was his message that inspired me. So honestly, I'm just going to stand on his shoulders, teach from, uh, you know, re- read from the Gospels, and uh, point you to Jesus. Is that cool? All right. Great, great. Well, this morning we're going to look at one of Jesus' miracles in Mark chapter 7. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, you can turn or um, click with me to uh, Mark 7. We'll start in verse 31. So while you're turning there, I kind of want to give you some of my intentions in the way that we want to look at this uh, piece of Scripture this morning. I kind of want to look at it with a bit of a different lens. And I want to look at it with a lens of how God sometimes doesn't fit our expectations, you know, and how we can read certain passages in the Scripture and interpret them as a recipe for success rather than a story of a relationship. You with me so far? All right. God calls you and me into relationship, and we're all under the same house rules when it comes to that, so to speak. That's the commands of God. But outside of that, you know, we all take different journeys to different places. And most likely, you know, your journey is not going to look the same as mine. But it's easy you know, to turn that relationship into a recipe to get what we expect God to do for us. Today we're going to be in the book of Mark, as I said, and uh, this is another miracle, and it's one of many miracles in the book of Mark. Mark has more miracles than any of the other gospel accounts. We see that miracles just happen to be like an awesome, um, amazing, normal part of Jesus' ministry. And in uh, Mark's gospel, one of the four gospel stories, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, He's primarily writing to a Roman audience, and he's wanting them to understand that Jesus isn't just the Jewish Messiah, he's the world's Messiah. And so he emphasizes this point with a lot of examples of Jesus healing uh, Gentiles instead of just Jews. And now, something to consider, you know, as we uh, read through this passage, you know, when the four gospel writers wrote their good news story of Jesus, they didn't exactly expect people to be walking through them verse by verse, right? Chapters and verses, you know, they didn't show up to the 16th century. And, you know, yeah, maybe some, um, you know, highly educated or rich people would have some scrolls, but for the most part, everyday people, kind of like us, we would hear this story read to them as a whole. So that's what I want to do. I kind of want to think about this piece of uh, scripture here as part of the whole story. You know, think about it as a movie, right? Um, When you go to the movie theater, you know, you don't sit down, watch one scene, stop, come back next Sunday to watch the next scene, right? No, you, you consider them all as a whole. The story all ties together. Now, we dissect the scriptures here on Sundays verse by verse, and we do so to dig a deeper understanding of that whole story. But it's important to remember, these verses, these accounts of various miracles that Mark is telling us about are written to be part of the whole story, you know, just as scenes in a movie, it ties together the whole story. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. So, as I said, uh, this is one miracle is kind of building on other ones. 
Um, so we're going to be in Mark 7. Let me give you some context. Jesus is taking a, about a 35-mile trip away from the Sea of Galilee, which is where uh, most of his ministry took place. And he went up to this place called Tyre. And there he came across a woman who had heard about Jesus and his miracles. She came to him and, and begged him to drive a demon from her daughter. And Jesus' response is very interesting. He gives us some insights uh, into the context for God's game plan uh, to reach the world. You know, here's what Jesus replied uh, to her in verse 27. He says to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And in verse 28, she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And in her humility and brokenness, Jesus answers her plea and from afar drove the demon from her daughter. This is interesting because we see in this story and from uh, uh, Romans chapter 1 where Paul writes that salvation is first to the Jews, then the Gentiles, which by the way uh, fulfills a promise that goes all the way back to Abraham. We see that God's plan was to start with a group of believers to show the rest of the world who his son is and who this salvation is. And though it's not time for the Gentiles yet, that comes after the cross. You know, that's the church's mission. But this Gentile woman who begged simply for the crumbs of that work, seemed to understand in some capacity, and Jesus was compassionate, which you know, we see as a, a reoccurring theme throughout Scripture, especially in these Gospels. And so now, after he's been uh, up north in Tyre, he's coming back down to this place called uh, Decapolis. Now, Decapolis, which means a ten, was a group of small towns that kind of united together to, to work together for like, economic reasons. And this place, the capitalist, was primarily Gentile, okay? And as we're going to see in our passage today, Jesus heals a man who lives here in the capitalist. He happens to be a Gentile, and this is a man who could neither hear nor speak. So that's, as we're kind of setting this up, you can kind of see some of the arc of the story that Mark is telling so far. You know, it's just one more example, right? This is Mark's narrative. Jesus is Savior of all. He especially, he responds to those who seek him. And if we take, you know, take it just for that, it's a pretty simple lesson to learn, right? It's just one more example, Jesus, Savior of all. Got it? Great. That's it. Let's go home. <laughs> Not that easy, I guess. Uh, but if we step back and look at this as if we were right there, especially if we were there as a God-fearing, law obeying Jew, watching what Jesus did, how would that blow our mind? You know, how would that... How would that seem to us? It's easy for us to look back, hindsight. But if you were right there, would it wreck our tendency to treat God like a relationship for success? Would it call us towards relationship? So that's, that's the kind of lens I want to look at it, you know, this morning. So we pick up to Mark chapter 7, starting in verse 31. <clears throat> and by the way, this is going to take forever if I don't, if I keep stopping like this. But uh, I want to give you some context. This is, uh, we're going to see that Jesus... Is, uh, is being followed by a crowd, right? And this region of Decapolis is the same area well, back in Mark chapter 5. Jesus healed the crazy man who was uh, running around naked through the tombs, mutilating himself. He's freaking everybody out. Do you remember that? So uh, Dale taught it. It's, it's been about a year, actually. Um, we had a little break there. Uh, but it was uh, back in Luke chapter 8, there was an account of it. And Mark chapter 5 also has one. Uh, if you remember, Jesus cast out legions of demons from this guy, and uh, people in the area were all freaked out because they knew this guy, right? Uh, he was a crazy man who was possessed by demons, and now they're freaked out because they saw him clothed and in his right mind. And after having the demons cast out of him, he wanted to go with Jesus, but Jesus told him, no, 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 you can't go with me. You stay here. You go back. Tell people what I have done. And then he told them, and that's one of the reasons why there's a big crowd when Jesus comes back. Make sense? All right, here we go. Finally, verse 31. Read along with me. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they, what does that word say? Begged. Underline that word. It will be important, I promise. They begged him to lay his hand on him. Verse 33, and taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers in his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue. By the way, that sounds a little weird. Right? The, uh, the junior higher in me wants to laugh at this. I don't know about you. <laughs> but uh, what you need to know is that back then, uh, 
it's not as gross as we kind of think of it now. They, they, for whatever reason, they saw the spit of a powerful person had special properties. Go figure. So this is kind of what they would have expected from a powerful leader. It fits in their paradigm. <clears throat> All right. And looking up to heaven, this is verse 34, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. So there's the story. Right? And that's, this is how it fits in with this kind of big picture of what Mark is saying. Jesus, Savior of all mankind, especially to those who seek him, Jew or Gentile. And as I said a few moments ago, um, I want to step back. Imagine if we are there with an understanding of whom we think Jesus is and we, how we think he's supposed to act. And I think if we do that, we may ask ourselves, what's wrong with this miracle? And I see four things that don't fit in the boxes we tend to put God in. The first one is this. If you really think about it, Jesus healed the wrong guy. Right? If you really think about it, from our perspective, as we step back and see from a, our viewpoint of a law-abiding, God-fearing, Jewish point of view, Jesus healed the wrong guy. You see, Jesus was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. We saw that in the previous verses uh, with, with the woman who wanted him to cast out a demon. Right? He says, I've come for the lost sheep of Israel. This is my assignment. I'm the Jewish Messiah. Now here's what I want you to catch. In this passage, Jesus, this guy, he's healing a Gentile pagan, not a God-fearing man. And there's, there's a difference, right? Generally, Gentiles didn't turn to Jewish rabbis. But, I mean, if you have a problem and somebody has a power, you go there, right? You know, this guy and his friends, they aren't there because they want to follow Jesus. They're, be, they're, they're there because they think he's got the power. And so Jesus heals this guy, and that's fine, except for this. You realize there was plenty of God-fearing law of Moses obeying Jewish men and women who desperately needed their own miracle and never got it. I mean, think about that. This is the Jewish Messiah. What's he doing over here in a Gentile region? And if you and I are a God-fearing, law-obeying Jew, it's a little bit of, well, well, why him? What about me? Right? Or, or, or why is everything happening to me? Or, or why is, is, is that getting to happen to them? You ever been there in life? There are, these are, are plenty of legitimate questions if we are stepping back because you know, God doesn't fit what we understand his mission was supposed to be. It's like, I mean, it's the wrong guy. He's not even a God-fearing guy. Why would you waste your time here? Why would you turn your back on those who are truly seeking you and in this earthly life truly have a problem? I think this is an important principle to understand because one of the worst things that can happen to your walk and my walk with God is that we start asking, why them? Why not me? Because instead of following God in relationship, we try to manipulate God as a recipe. So I call this message Recipe for Disaster. <clears throat> I want to show you a couple passages that speak to this. You can keep your finger there in, um, in Mark 7, but first one's in John. We're going to bounce all over the, um, the Gospels today. First one's in John chapter 21. We're going to start in verse 18. While you turn there, I'm going to give you some context. Um, this is after Jesus had been resurrected, but he's still on earth. This is the third time he reveals himself to the disciples, uh, you know, because after his death, they all kind of scattered, and now he's kind of gathering them back together. This is right after um, the miracle of uh, uh, the guys, you know, they were out there fishing. Remember this one? They, were, they all scattered, right? And they didn't know what to do, so they're a bunch of fishermen. What do they do? Well, I'm going to go fishing, right? So, the story picks up with seven of the disciples out there fishing all night, weren't catching anything, and then Jesus appears, but the disciples didn't know it was Jesus, and he asked them, hey, you guys, uh, you guys catching anything? He said, no. He's like, uh, oh, why don't you try your net on the other side? 
I mean, can you imagine what their response was? I mean, these guys are professional fishermen. At least they were before Jesus called them into ministry. He's like, okay, guy, whatever. I don't think they tried that. Yeah, of course they did. Um, they've been fishing all night. And anyway, they did this. Uh, they, they couldn't even haul in the net into the boat because it was so full of fish. And of course, they realized, hey, it's Jesus. <laughs> Here's your sign, right? And then after that, they all had breakfast on the beach, which is kind of fun. There's this lead dog among the disciples, this guy named Peter. Uh, Peter's the guy, remember, he boastfully said to Jesus, you know, I will never deny you. I'm all in. And Jesus said to him, dude, he called Peter, dude. Uh, be, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And sure enough, famous story of Peter on the night of Jesus' betrayal and arrest. He denies him three times. Of course, Peter, he, he wasn't there when Jesus uh, dies. He wasn't there when he resurrected and all these disciples run. And so now this is you know, that point where Jesus kind of pulling them back together um, to be about their mission here on earth because he's the God of second chances. Amen. So he's talking to Peter after breakfast and in parallel, parallel to Peter's three denials, Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Peter says, yes, Lord, of course I love you. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. You know, despite your failures, I'm assigning you to feed my sheep, take care of my people, and be the spiritual leader they're going to need. So this is where we pick up the story, where Jesus is walking along the beach with Peter. He says to him, verse 18, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was going to glorify God. This is referencing the fact that you know, we know Peter was uh, crucified. Many traditions say he was crucified upside down because he didn't feel worthy to be crucified in the same way his Lord was. You know, this, is, this is Jesus saying to him, look, you're going to be in a situation you don't want to face. So picking up back in verse 19, he said, After saying this, he, Jesus, said to him, Peter, follow me. Right? I'm the relationship. I'm your Lord. Follow me. And well, as this happens, verse 20 says this, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following him. I think this is funny. Anytime this pops up in Scripture, John, who's the writer of this, uh, this gospel, the Apostle John, who, you know, he, he was like Jesus' best friend. Okay? And Jesus had this inner circle uh, of, of guys, it was uh, John, James, and Peter, but John was kind of the best friend, and he likes to bring it up, right, anytime he, he gets a chance to. It's like, look, dude, I'm the best man. You're just an usher. <laughs> you know. Verse 21, when Peter saw him, John, he said to him, well, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is it to you? You follow me. What did he tell Peter? Basically said, it's none of your business, dude. He calls him dude. <laughs> if, and, and he literally said, if I want him to stay alive until the second coming of Christ, what is that to you? Don't worry about him. You follow me. You know, but this is the problem that we have when we treat God like a recipe. You know, because we expect God to always be doing the same thing for everybody in the same situation. We know that's not right. So let's turn now to uh, another gospel. Um, it's a really similar one. I really want to drive this, this point home of this comparison and how it's poison to our souls, how it destroys this personal walk with Jesus and turns it into nothing but a spiritual recipe of manipulation. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 20. Look in the uh, first about 15 verses or so. It'll be up on the screen. should be if, um, if you guys need to. This is a parable that Jesus used to show what the kingdom of God was like. And to tell this story, he uses this imagery of uh, day laborers. And this, this was very common to them in, in, in that time. Um, it's not unlike the day laborers that we know about. I mean, I don't see it much here in Washington, but maybe you do. The, in, but in California, it was extremely common to see uh, day laborers meet at like a Home Depot or you know, hardware store. And they were there to... Just hang out and see if someone's going to pick him up for some work for the day. So we can understand this. And of course, as a day laborer, um, you know, you show up with that hope that you want to get work today. That's your goal. That's what you're there for. So verse 1, Matthew 20, Jesus says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. 
after agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, a denarius was a, a day's wage back then, so this was a fair wage, he sent them into the vineyard. And going out about the third hour, that's around nine in the morning, by the way, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever's right, I will give you. So they went. Going out again around the sixth hour, this is about noon, and again the ninth hour, I'm doing my math right, this is three o'clock, he did the same. And about the 11th hour, this is 5 p.m., and by the way, the work day ended at 6, okay? He went out and found others standing, and he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? Then he said to them, sorry, they said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too, and when, every, when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius. Sweet. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. And upon receiving it, they all said, Hallelujah, what a great day. We got exactly what we wanted. Does your Bible say that? No. <laughs> it says, and upon receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you, gave, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Right? What, what did he promise them? A denarius. What were they excited to agree upon and get? A denarius, right? It's like, this is great. Until someone else got a better deal. Now, you and I wouldn't have any of those tendencies, right? <laughs> but maybe we know someone who does, so we'll keep reading. <laughs> Take what belongs to you and go. Verse 14. I choose to give to the last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? You see, when I treat God like a recipe, I get really upset when you put a dollar in the vending machine and you get two Snickers, and I only got one. I said Snickers, now you're all thinking about it. Me too. You see, in this story, Jesus asks us to follow him, and our denarius, our reward, what he has promised us, is forgiveness of sins and to be adopted into his family, to have the Holy Spirit come and change us from the inside out, to have an eternity in heaven in which we are joint heirs, sharing everything that belongs to Jesus as sons and daughters of the King. And we're really excited about this at first. You know, we have a pathway to get there. For some, it's long. For some, it's short. For some, it's easy. For some, it's hard. For some, it's got highs. For some, it's got lows. And everything's fine until I find out your journey is easier. You know, that my lows stay down in the valley and your lows are kind of part of ups and downs. I'm happy about this journey. I'm fine with it until I find out yours is easier or you got more. And if God is a force out in heaven who's manipulated by my proper prayers, my sacrifice, my service, or whatever else we put in our check boxes, then I have every right to be angry with him. But if it's a relationship and he's given me everything he's promised. I have no right to be upset just because someone else got a better deal than I did. Because I already got the most amazing deal, right? Put yourself in the shoes of these day laborers, right? When you showed up in the morning, you absolutely wanted, desperately needed work for the day. And you got it. But we can go from thrilled to grumbling in an instant. God's grace and mercy are unmerited. Mercy, unmerited forgiveness. Grace, unmerited blessing. If they're earned, they're called wages, right? It's not mercy when I let you off the hook for not doing anything. That's just fairness. You know, it's not grace when I give you what you deserve. It's when it's unmerited. And this leads to a lesson we can learn from this parable. It's, it's this. When my walk with God becomes a recipe, I assume that I earn my blessings and you deserve your hardships. Okay? 
When my walk with God becomes a recipe, I assume that I earn my blessings and you deserve your hardships. And of course, the flip side of that is that I assume something's really wrong with me when I'm walking with God and you get the blessing and I get the hardships. Right? It's, it's a telltale sign that something is wrong with our relationship with God when I say, why him? What about me? When I become angry with God, well, sorry, when I become angry because God gave me everything he promised, but he gave you more. Telltale sign that my relationship with God is becoming a spiritual recipe. That's not what he calls us to. So here's the second thing in this passage that jumps out as uh, kind of strange to me, and I had you underline it. It was this. Jesus made them beg for help. Did you catch that? You know, I mean, we can read this passage, okay, whatever they, they pleaded, sure. Um, it's kind of interesting, you ever read through some of these miracles and you kind of notice this word popping up a lot. It's a whole bunch of times that people had to beg. I mean, even the woman in, in the previous verses, same thing, said, said the same thing. She begged Jesus. So I, I kind of want to go there with this word. I don't want to just let it kind of pass over us. I kind of want to experience it. Can you, can you imagine this? Jesus is walking along and, and these guys have, have brought their friend along. They've gone through this whole process and you know, they heard that he's got the power to do some healing. And he said, hey, hey, Jesus, Jesus, over here. You know, he just walks on by. He's like, dude, I, for sure, I thought he heard me. Hey, try, hey, Jesus, hey, will you come over here and pray for my friend? You know, maybe Jesus turns and looks at him, just stares. I mean, it's, can you imagine what that would be like? It's kind of weird. And here's what I want us to understand. And, and by the way, I don't know why it is like this. But the Bible is crystal clear. Jesus was crystal clear in his teaching and in his actions that persistence, that is, the need to persistently pursue God, is normal. That's how it works, friends. Persistence is par for the course. It's a normal, normal part of the relationship we have with God. This is one of those incidents, like, why? I, I don't know. You know, it's one of those things, I'm, you know, he's dad, I'm the kid. I mean, maybe some of you guys, a lot of you are parents, and if you weren't, you know, you were a kid at one point, so you understand this. You know, when a kid says, hey, can I have ice cream for breakfast? You say, no. So why? Because well, I said so. So I'm the dad. You're the kid. Right? Kids have been there before. How do you explain to a kid, I don't want you to develop habits that are going to hurt you later on in life. I love you, and I know what's best for you, but you don't understand this yet, so you're just going to have to trust me. That makes sense, Right? You know, and I get angry in this immature state when God doesn't respond, when I do what he asked me the first time. If, if we're treating it like a recipe, right? But in a relationship, you know, I may get frustrated, I may get confused, I may have to be patient, and that's tough, but I keep trusting, right? In relationship, I know that he knows things that I don't and that he has my best interest in mind. Because he's dad and I'm the kid, so I keep following. All right, another parable. Um, this time it's in Luke chapter 11. Um, to give us reference, there's two times in the Gospels where Jesus taught his disciples, disciples uh, specifically how to pray. So uh, in Luke 11, the disciples asked Jesus plainly, would you teach us how to pray? So he gave them the Lord's Prayer. Uh, again, um, he taught them this in Matthew 6. You know, Jesus was specifically teaching them not to pray like the hypocrites in the synagogues. synagogues. And, and by the way, this is interesting, they're different, okay? Which means the Lord's Prayer was never meant to be a recipe prayer, right? There's no magic in reciting it word for word. It's not a recipe. It's a template of things to pray about, right? Because if there's power in reciting it word for word, then Jesus messed up big time because he didn't get it right the second time. Right? So we see that it's a template for things to pray for, not a prayer to recite. And then to help them uh, understand how this whole thing works, he tells them this parable, Luke 11. I'll paraphrase it for you. Um, you can read it on your own. Um, he said, there's this, uh, this, this guy who's hosting a friend late at night, and uh, he's got no food to uh, feed his friend, so he goes to his, his neighbor's house. And by the way, this is a, a very hospitable culture. Right? So he goes to his neighbor's house late at night, knocks on the door, says, hey man, can I borrow some eggs? 
And uh, you know, Jesus says in the, in the parable that this guy you know, said, hey, man, we're all, we're all sleeping here. You know, I can't help you. Go away. And then so the, the, the friend just keeps knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking. And Jesus says that the neighbor will get up and give him what he asks, not because he is a friend, but because of his persistence. Now, I'm thinking, uh, I mean, that's not how it should be, right? right? Lord, if you have any compassion, if you really know what my needs are, if you really love me like you say that you do, you should help me out here. I mean, I ought at least to have fridge privileges, right? You guys have friends like that? You've, uh, you've achieved the friendship reward of fridge privileges? <laughs> if you don't have some, you should get some. That's great. You, know, it's, uh, you, don't, you don't have to ask, let alone, you have, let alone you don't have to beg to say, hey, can I get something out of the fridge? You, just, you got fridge privileges. You'd think that would be our relationship with, with God. But uh, Jesus is teaching this, this uh, lesson of persistence. And again, over in Luke 18, uh, Jesus taught them, I'll paraphrase it again, Jesus taught them about uh, persistence. In, in verse 1 of 18, literally says, to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. And then he proceeds to talk about this parable. He says that prayer, persistence in prayer, is a lot like a widow who needs justice. Right? She went to this uh, ungodly judge and she hounded him and hounded him and hounded him for, for justice. And it says, finally he gave in. Not because he was godly and saw justice, but because he couldn't stand her nagging. And, I mean, it's strange, but we can learn something from this. You know? Verse 7 gives a little bit of perspective of, of God's intentions. It says, And will not God give justice to the elect? who cry to him day and night, will he delay over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. So the lesson from this is this. Don't give up. Okay? Don't give up. But if we treat God like a recipe, that's going to be our temptation. Because when my walk with God becomes like a recipe for my success, I start to think that God is like some cosmic vending machine. Right? Right? And, and when your persistence takes 21 days and mine takes 21 years, I'm mad at the machine, right? You ever been there? You, ever, you, you put a buck or two in the vending machine, you, you push the button, and you didn't get what you were supposed to get, right? I mean, what do you do? He's like, eh, I didn't need it anyway, right? No, you're probably a lot like me. I look at that sucker. And then I look around to see if anybody from church is looking. <laughs> well, you guys know the rest. Because you've done the same thing, right? <laughs> Why? Because it owes me. I did my part. That stupid machine didn't do its part. Right? You see, our walk with God is in trouble if we live with that kind of attitude towards him. We're going to become angry and resentful instead of incredibly grateful for our denarius. He knows things I don't know about the journey. Right? I can never pray enough. I can never read my Bible enough that I will understand everything that he does. I'll get that when I'm with him in heaven. In the meantime, it's a relationship. And God invites us to trust him enough to do what he says, even when it doesn't seem to be working right now. Your denarius is coming. Don't worry about someone else's path. Worry about your own. So here's the third thing that seems uh, wrong about this miracle to me. It's this. From their viewpoint, Jesus healed them in the wrong way. You see, what these guys uh, had seen or perhaps heard about what Jesus normally does and how he normally heals people, you know, he'd either uh, speak a word or he'd uh, lay a hand and, you know, and pray publicly and, and you know, boom, everything's okay. I mean, they, 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 they ask him literally, it's like, will you just, they've seen this before, will you place your hand on him? So they, they, they know the routine. They've seen it before. And so it threw them off when, when Jesus, uh, uh, first of all, they, they had to beg to get his attention, right? And then secondly, Jesus pulled them aside privately, away from the crowd, 
uh, instead of publicly. And then, then, you know, Jesus gives them a little wet willy and (laughs) ta-da. So, I mean, what can we learn from this? From their kind of confusion? I think it's this, that God seldom uses the same game plan twice. Right, you remember the first time he was uh, in the Decapolis, um, you know, he said to the guy, uh, no, you can't come with me, you stay here. Tell people about what I've done. You know, and now this time he says, don't tell anybody. Right, sometimes he speaks, sometimes he touches, sometimes he spits. God seldom uses the game plan, same game plan twice. We've seen this in the Old Testament too, right? I mean, one time there's a burning bush. Moses got the burning bush. Nobody else got a burning bush. You know, one time the mouths of lions are closed up for Daniel. Everybody else gets eaten. Right? One time God said to march around the city seven times, blow your trumpets, so that, uh, you know, the, the, the dissonance causes the walls to come down and Jericho is captured. Every other time, you know, everybody just says, man, it's the dumbest parade I've ever seen. You know, but when I treat my relationship with God like a recipe, I inevitably put God in a box. I keep going back to the same thing over and over, expecting God to show up on my terms, in my way, on my timetable. Now, I mean, relationships are confusing, right? Many of you have been married to, uh, to your spouse for a long time, and you have a great relationship. You, you communicate very well, but you're still st- surprised by them, right? I am. You know, that's why. That's just the way relationships are. They're dynamic, right? Recipes put God in a box. And when we do that, it's so easy to become like the Pharisees. Remember these guys, they, they themselves, they consider themselves, and they probably were, that, to be most committed to God. But then they start thinking that they have God all figured out. And then when God shows up in the form of Jesus, and he doesn't fit the box that they're putting him in, you know, instead of welcoming, welcoming, him, <laughs> welcoming him in as their savior, they conspire to kill him. I want to tell you another great story uh, about, uh, it's in 2 Kings, we're going Old Testament finally. 2 Kings chapter 5 about this guy named Nahum. Now Nahum was uh, a commander of the army for the king of Syria. Uh, your Bible may say like Aram, Aram or Aram, I don't know which word it is. Uh, it's the present day Syria, okay? So at this point, 2 Kings chapter 5, Syria was oppressing the Israelites. And Nahum, this commander of the Syrian army, he gets leprosy. And so, I'm kind of paraphrasing this first part of the story, but when Nahum's wife, uh, or Nahum's wife had a, a servant girl that uh, they, they captured from Israel, and this Jewish servant girl told them about a prophet in Israel uh, who can heal named Elisha. So the king of Syria sends Nahum, his top, most beloved general, to Israel. And a long story short, he ends up in front of Elisha, who says, yeah, yeah, I can heal you. Uh, you know, here's what I want you to do. You see this dirty, tiny little, little river over here called the Jordan? I want you to, uh, to wash in it seven times, and you'll be clean. So this is where we pick up the story. And I, I want you to hear the, the response of this guy, Nahum, because uh, he had God in a box. Let's read along with this. 2 Kings 5, starting at uh, verse 11. It says this. But Nahum was angry and went away, saying, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and far, far the rivers of Damascus uh, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. But his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, wash and be cleaned? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. So you see what happens when we put God in a box, right? We miss out on all the blessings he wants to give us. When he tells you to do some really goofy thing, you're going to say, well, that's not how we did it before, right? No, you don't put God in a box. You put God in a relationship, and relationships are dynamic. Because if we keep treating God like a recipe for our success, the wrong mindset is going to develop. You know, you're, you're... 
I'm victim of this too. You're going to read some, some Christian biographies and say, oh, that's how this person was blessed. Or, ah, that's, uh, that's how that person overcame hardships. You know, he did this fast. He prayed this prayer. He gave money to this or to that. I'm going to do whatever he or she did, and God will do the same thing for me as they did for them. And he won't. He doesn't. You know, you're going to read Bible stories and think, oh, well, that worked for Daniel. But friends, let me tell you, it won't work for you. Stay behind the fence at the zoo. It's like a joke grenade. You've got to wait for it. <laughs> uh, the, the, listen, the stories are about God and us. And newsflash, newsflash, you ain't the hero in this story. But that's what we tend to do. We tend to think it's all about us. And we treat God like a recipe for our success. The final thing uh, that seems wrong with this parable is this. Jesus told them not to tell anybody. Now, hang with me on this because uh, you know, this isn't Bible. This is just my opinion. But I don't think that this was some kind of psychological ploy by Jesus. You know, I don't think he told them don't tell anybody knowing full well that they will. You know? or some reverse psychology thing. I don't think it's that, and here's why. It's because of this. Here's what we know. Jesus didn't come to heal everybody of their earthly problems. He came to pay for our eternity problem. Right? His mission was to go to the cross. His mission was to teach the principles of the kingdom of heaven on the way to the cross. And along the way, some hors d'oeuvres of heaven were given out to some people called healings. And I think he didn't want this guy, you know, to go out there and spread the message that, hey, Jesus is here. If you got sickness or need to be healed, he's your guy. That wasn't the true message. It wasn't his true mission because he came to solve our eternity problem, not our earthly problems. You know, and that's, uh, that's, that's the application for this point is to remember that God sent Jesus on a rescue mission. For you and me, that God is alive, he is active in our daily lives, and in relationship, it looks different for each of us. And if we aren't careful, sometimes we can hear someone else's God story and believe that just because I didn't get blessed the same way that you did, that God doesn't like me as much as he likes you. You see, when my walk with God becomes a recipe, I assume that whatever he did for me, he's going to do for you, whatever he did for you, he's going to do the same thing for me. But the denarius is for us all. The view along the journey looks different for us all. And so, I, I leave you with this today. What are you seeking? A relationship with God or a recipe for an easier life? You know, I think what tends to happen in our flesh, is we so quickly move from relationship to recipe because we actually do all want an easier life. I mean, me too. I fall into this very easily. You know, I mean, this is why I wanted to give this message this morning, right? I need it. And believe me, I'm not here to say that you're all messed up because you think this way. I'm here to say we're all messed up because we think this way, right? And the thing that we need to understand is that God is calling us to something greater than a recipe, because the devil loves it when we have a recipe. You see, a recipe faith sees God as one to be manipulated for my good, but a relationship faith sees God as God. And I'm incredibly privileged to have been freed from the prison of my own sin, the destiny of my own eternal separation from God, and I have the privilege to follow him wherever he leads me because he says, come, I'll take you to freedom. So what are you seeking today? You know, some of you have a problem. Some of you need an answer. Some of you need a healing. My advice is this, keep on keeping on until he's absolutely said no or until you don't care anymore. But make sure whatever it is that we're fostering a relationship with the king of kings, not a recipe with a cosmic force. Amen? Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for um, God, this reminder 
Uh, that's your dad. We're the kids. That you know best. And that you call us into a relationship. And that you will not be manipulated by what our game plan is. That you so graciously call us into relationship with you. And that everything you have for us is for our own good. So thank you, Lord. Thank you for loving so much, so well. Now we would, as we sing, as we respond here in worship, as we respond with our offerings, bringing them to you joyfully, trusting you with not only our finances, but our lives in general. We give you the glory. We give you the praise. Because you are worthy. Thank you for that, God. Thank you. We love you and we praise you. Hear us, God, as we sing. In Jesus' name, amen.